Hello and many thanks for joining us. Now, after the irrational 1960s to 2000, coup d'etat dropped to around two a year in the two decades up to 2019. But just two years into the current decade, there's been a noticeably higher than average number. Seven coup or attempted coup have been recorded so far. During the pandemic, there were two successful coup in Mali in 2020 and in May 2021. On March 31st, an attempt was thwarted in Niger just two days before the swearing-in of the then president-elect. Also, this year, on September 5th, officers of an elite Special Forces Army unit overthrew the 83-year-old Guinean president, Alpha Conde. The most recent is in Sudan, where a fragile power-sharing agreement came to an abrupt end on October 25. Aside actual military coup d'etat, there are the constitutional ones. Since 2015, according to the African Center for Strategic Studies, leaders of 13 African countries, including most recently Ivory Coast, where a, a controversial rather third term was won by the incumbent, they've all evaded or overseen the further weakening of term limit restrictions that had been in place to protect democracy. So today on one slot, we will be discussing why coup d'etat is making a comeback to the emergence and seeming entrenchment of constitutional coup, and most importantly, how we can threaten measures to constrain this governmental military tyranny. My guest today is Mr. Mbule Nzege Leonard, a research analyst for West Africa at Africa Risk Consulting a political risk firm affiliated with the Institute for Democracy, Citizenship and Public Policy in Africa at the University of Cape Town. His writing has been featured in many publications, including Bloomberg and Financial Times. Many thanks for joining us, Mr. Mbule Nzege. Thank you for joining us on the program. Uh, thank you very much, Felicity, and um, it's a pleasure being on this uh, wonderful program as well. Let's get kicking. I mean, one would expect that democracy should be growing, but it seems we, we're going back to a time or a period where promises are made and they're not uh, kept. Coup d'etat. Why do we keep sexing or circling back to it? You know, as you rightly uh, introduced um, at the beginning, the, the military coup was the most prevalent form of regime change uh, across the continent from the 1960s right into the 1990s. But then with the reintroduction of multi-party politics from the end of the 1980s, there was a belief that, um, you know, the continent had turned the corner with respect to the use of military takeovers as a way of acceding to power. And you rarely noted um, from 2000 up until 2020, there were uh, 20 million military coups, so about uh, two military coups per year. And in the last decade, we really saw um, a great short, we really saw a significant decrease in this situation. And we thought that we had turned the corner, but um, with the onset of the new decade, as you said, Mali's experienced two coup d'etats, successful coup d'etats. Um, Guinea Conakry just had theirs in September, and a few weeks ago, Sudan Republic um, has also experienced a uh, military coup. So it is um, a step in the wrong direction, and it is a worrying trend uh, for lovers of democracy and those who would like to see civilian rule prevail on the continent. The fact is, what is it about coup d'etat that makes uh, leaders think that that is the way to go in a 21st century. What are some of the factors you think are responsible for this? Well, the, the emergence of a coup d'etat in each country is as a result of specific circumstances. However, um, in, all circum in all coup d'etat situations, the commonality is that you have weak civil political institutions. And this can be as a result of structural deficits, whereby maybe a country has been poor for an extended period of time and didn't have the resources to build other political institutions 
elections. However, in most instances, this is as a result of the political elite eroding the political institutions. That is, they've highly politicized and corrupted the state bureaucracy, uh, the judiciary, the legislator. The various arms of government have been corrupted and they've been eroded to favor the political elite. And in many instances, that has you know, led to uh, dissatisfaction amongst the population. And this leads to protests, at least it's disgruntlement. And the military is usually seen as an institution which is above the political intrigues of civilian political elites. Um, they're usually very well resourced. They have yeah, access but, to but just, to, just to cut in there and say that these things you've highlighted, in the course of my prepping for this program, I was thinking about it because they make promises that they are going to make changes. They are going to deal with corruption. But at the end of the day, when these people come into power, the corruption seems to supersede when you have civilian uh, governments in power. So, um, I mean, they make promises that they don't fulfill. So why? The question remains, should we circle back to um, actions that don't seem to benefit the African population? Well, it's quite tricky because um, we've seen instances where uh, military coups occur and they actually set order because, as we said, the military is in, regarded as an institution which can establish order and stability. We've seen it in Egypt and we've seen it in Algeria where military coups are actually welcome because the civilian governments at the time really couldn't handle the challenges which um, were prevailing in the country. Um, Burkina Faso with the overthrow of Blaise Camarari, who had been trying to go for a third term. His overthrow was um, by the military was welcome. In Niger in 2010, um, the military coup led to the institution of um, a democratic regime whereby the political elites subsequently um, adhere to constitutional order. So I think Africans in many respects, even though they know about the past malfeasance of military regimes, they look at it and say, you know what, there's a possibility that these individuals well, we can hold them to a higher standard. We can actually believe what they say because there are outlier cases whereby the military does come in and then they set, you know, they set things in order for um, su um, sustainable um, civilian political rule. All right. There, there seem to um, exist uh, possible evidence that there is some external involvement and sponsorship of coup in Africa. Uh, so to speak. And uh, some scholars have said that this evidence, no matter how small, cannot be ignored. Have you heard that there, there, there is any sort of evidence of sponsored coup in Africa? And how relevant will this information be in our quest to push this kind of um, resort to governance out? Well, it's quite interesting when, you, when we hear about the notion of uh, ex external involvement. Obviously, during the Cold War era, when the geopolitical stakes were quite higher, there was a lot of um, foreign involvement in political coups. But then, for the most part, most of the um, reasons which have um, led to the military coups have been very generic. They've been domestic-oriented, and there hasn't been necessarily a need for foreign involvement. However, you have situations like in Sudan where you have uh, external powers or extend, external um, players such as Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, um, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They have a very strong interest not to see a civilian government come into power because a successful civilian government you know, puts into question the sort of rule that has been prevailing in those countries. So even if they don't have a direct involvement, their actions in the aftermath of the coup, for example, the provision of financial assistance, um, trying to uh, derive diplomatic support on the international stage for the, in, um, the incoming military leaders. Those are signs that even if there wasn't external involvement, there is support for it. So that's more of what we're seeing in contemporary coups. Or as you said, right now in um, Mali, Russia has really been at the forefront of trying to be a big security player with the Malian transitional regime while the West has decided to turn its back on Mali because of the successful successive military coup. So the nature of involvement has changed from a direct um, sort of intervention to providing different forms of support um, in the current states. Okay, let's go back to talking about the, um, the nature of coup itself. In my introduction, I talked about the, the, the seeming emergence of constitutional coup 
where sitting governments try to manipulate the law so that they can stay in power. A, a very recent case, Ivory Coast, I think. I'm not 100% sure of that fact right now. But the question I'm trying to find out is, what about constitutional coup? How lethal is this development for our democracy? Constitutional coups, I think, are probably the biggest threat to democracy, they're even more threatening than military coups because constitutional coups, that is um, situations where the incumbent president tries to um, go for a term beyond what has been stipulated in the constitution, which is usually two uh, presidential mandates, they have been the cause of presidential for military takeovers. In Niger, Mamadou Tanja, he was overthrown in 2010 because he wanted to go for a third um, uh, presidential term. Blaise Camporore, 2014, he was overthrown because he wanted to go for another presidential term after having been in office for 27 years. Alpha Conde, he was overthrown um, in September, and one of the grievances against him was the fact that he had gone for a third presidential term. President Ouattara in Cote d'Ivoire, he didn't face the military, um, he didn't face um, pressure from the military. However, there was significant violence during um, the electoral period whereby he decided to go for a third term. So they are very, very dangerous because what happens is that the ability to go in for the third term is as a result of the erosion of the political institutions, which are supposed to keep the presidents and the regimes in check. So what you have is a scenario where the constitutional courts, the electoral commissions, uh, the legislature, they have been captured by the ruling elite. And as a result, they are engineered in a way to work in their favor. And as a result, the military usually has to come in because there is serious disconnect amongst the population. However, the civilian political institutions have been watered down to the point that their voices cannot be used to you know, hold the leaders accountable. And as a result, the military steps in. So those are four distinct cases um, where you had a scenario where um, the um, constitutional coups have led to military takeovers, or three, should I say, three. Okay. Um, so let me just quickly clarify the uh, reference I made earlier. Uh, the recent coup was, um, the recent constitutional change, I think you even made reference to it, is Ivory Coast, the third term yeah. uh, ambition of the, uh, gov the incumbent president. Moving on now, while, while some say free and fair election is the answer to, you know, trying to thwart a uh, repeated coup, there are those who argue that, though necessary, it is insufficient, especially... Um, as we've mentioned, um, leaders trying to manipulate it as a tool for them to survive um, in a government. We know that this has happened in Cameroon, um, the um, Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea. Most of them have done this in order to retain power indefinitely. Managed elections, that's where I'm going to. It is helping to entrench this constitutional coup. So where will this leave us? What options are there for us to explore? You, you did say yourself that this is little. Yeah, and um, it's interesting that you've uh, mentioned that most of the countries that you've mentioned come from my region, uh, Francophone Central Africa, my home country, Cameroon. And there's actually a whole formula because um, what the leaders have come to realize that the international community, when it comes to democracy, they're going to look purely at electoralism. Do you hold multi-party elect uh, elections? Um, foreign observers will come, they'll tick boxes and say, you know, even though there were irregularities, um, they were more or less free and fair. And there's been a whole formula, as I said, there's a whole architecture to just rubber stamp these elections. They have captured uh, independent electoral commissions, the courts, the local administration, even the electoral code has been, um, you know, crafted in a way to favor the ruling, uh, the ruling elite. And this has been very, very detrimental because you have in several circumstances where, you know, power has been entrenched for several decades by just repeating this cycle. But then in other instances, like you had now in Guinea, you have Conde who won in the first round of his elections and then presidential elections. And then a year later, he's thrown out of power by a group of soldiers. So one of the things that needs to be done in order to remedy is this, this is that as Africans, um, we need to ensure that democracy is 
applied in a wholesale manner. We can't just stick to looking at elections as the all in all, because while, you know, um, you know, competition and freedom of choice is one aspect, there are a lot of other um, domains which are very important towards establishing a democratic order, instituting civil liberties by creating accountability, um, fostering good governance, ensuring that people have access to good socioeconomic livelihoods because you look at the African context, if you look at um, Afrobarometer surveys, people's definition of democracy is that they look at it as a form of governance which is supposed to improve people's access to socioeconomic opportunities. So looking solely at elections um, is, I think, a very short-sighted way of looking at how democracy should be applied um, in the con on the continent and in general across the world. So I think that the way we look at democracy really needs to be retooled in such a way that we look beyond just the electoral elements of it. All right, Mbule Zege Leonard. Um, let's take a short break. And when we come back, I'm going to have you uh, talk a bit more about how we can strengthen institutions so that our electoral process will be a little uh, better than we have today. Do stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you for staying with us. It is still one slot on New Central Television. I still have my guest with me, Mr. Mbule Nzege Leonard. Thank you for staying with us. Just before that break, we're talking about how we can strengthen uh, institutions. That is one of the uh, challenges that we find in Africa, where leaders are able to manipulate institutions to get their uh, purposes. So weak institutions play role in facilitating incumbents to manipulate the constitution. So the question would be, how can individual countries work to strengthen their institutions so that we don't have a scenario as we have now? Well, there's an old slogan, uh, power to the people. Mobilization through civil society. And you look at countries like where I'm based, South Africa, um, you have political elites who were trying to erode the institutions um, that were um, helping to consolidate democracy. And it was the civil society which played a very, very big role in alerting the situation to the general public. And the result uh, was that uh, we had uh, President Zuma, there was a lot of pressure and um, President Zuma had to take a step back and he eventually was out of power. The same in places like Senegal. Senegal has a very strong civil society. You had a scenario where um, President, former President Abdullah White, he tried to um, go in for a third presidential term, even though he, and even though he had a parliamentary majority, he wasn't able to because of a lot of civil society mobilization. Um, I know it's not easy, but in, across different countries, I mean, we've seen in your home country, Nigeria, with the NSARS movement, and you know there can be pushback. But I think. Popular mobilization is a very, very surefire mechanism. Well, not surefire, but then it can really do a lot to help strengthen institutions because the more people in, are involved, the more it creates awareness about where there are shortcomings in terms of institutional um, uh, institutional output, in terms of um, just the performance of leaders and so on and so forth. And civil society in itself is very multifaceted because it's not only in the political domain, it's in the local governance, it's at um, you know, economics, it's in social sense, it's in religious, it involves religious activity, it's all across the board. So um, civil society is a very, very, um, building civil society is a very, very important way to help to strengthen the institutions um, across African countries. You, 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 when you talk about all of these institutions, what about citizen participation? We don't seem to have a debt of commentators when it comes to political issues, but the participation that is required to, you know, elevate the thinking of the masses to ensure that they participate fully in electoral process, constitutional review and issues like that seems to be lacking. So how can leaders or sh should I say generally Africans find a way to self-motivate so that we can keep these leaders in check and avoid situations that will, de I mean, escalate to coup d'etat? 
I think constant mobilization, because what we do usually see, um, and I think it's also as a result of the fact that even at the level of civil society, the state has a very, very big role to play. I mean, civil society organizations, unless you're in a country like South Africa, your funding will most likely come from the state or from foreign donors. Uh, so it's very, very difficult to mobilize outside of, say, um, uh, the electoral season. But what I think is that in order for us to be able to mobilize, you need to find out what are the things which mean a lot to um, the citizenry. For example, most recently we had um, elections a couple of weeks of local elections in South Africa. And the issues which really mobilized people were access to basic services such as light and water. People might not necessarily care about parliamentary processes, they may not really care about the constitution, but then when you tell them that, you know, they elect the leaders you're electing at the local level, they are the ones who are responsible for providing these services for you. You know, it it, it, it lights a bulb in, um, in, in, in people's heads. So I think it's, you know, for us to really constantly educate and keep, you know, the citizenry on the toes about the things that we know mean most to them. So agricultural community, we need, we need to talk to them about, you know, um, this government, what they're doing is maybe preventing you from having a good for harvest or be able to export your goods. Um, maybe in terms of education, you know, they need to provide um, more access to quality education, not just schools and all. So it's about, you know, mobilizing as many people as consistently across a as many topics as possible and making them know that that's all part of the political process and just being an educated citizen. Let's talk about the role of regional blocs and, you know, of international organizations, but focusing primarily on um, organizations like the AU, the ECOWAS and the likes. What role? I mean, they, they were established to help promote a development in Africa and um, entrench togetherness, so to speak. But they don't seem to be stepping up to the plate. What are their role in this scenario? in an anti-coup policy, but then coups, as you know, as you're speaking about today, continue to be the order of the day in terms of, you know, um, the African governance architecture. And uh, we repeatedly see that they come late to the party. And, um, you know, one of the things I say about the African Union is that um, in as much as they are the overarching um, uh, organization that we should look to with respect to political, economic, and social affairs on the continent, they more or less are a trade union for heads of states. And the thing about a trade union is that you look out for the interests of your members. So it's very, very difficult to expect them to really hold their members to account because what they're trying to hold, um, what you're trying to hold one leader accountable for today, tomorrow, it might come to you. So it's very, very difficult. So they do things on a very superficial level. And we look at the situation um, currently in Guinea, what's happened in Mali, um, and what happened in um, Cote d'Ivoire earlier um, with respect to the third term um, ambitions of President Ouattara. And they were very, very underwhelming in their responses. In fact, in some instances, you could even say they were complacent because in many instances, you have you know the same people who are friends talking to each other. They've helped each other come to power. They've helped each other to maintain power. And it's very, very, you know, um, it's very much wishful thinking for us to expect them to stand in the same um, room with them and say, you know what, don't do this, don't do that, because they themselves who are speaking have been complicit or have been guilty of doing that. So, mm -hmm. um, and it's something which reverberates across the continent. Here in Southern Africa, right. the Southern African, sorry, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just really needed you to speak quickly on this in 30 seconds because we're out of time. I want to, uh, a scholar says African countries need to quantitatively democratize and truly decolonize. What do you understand by this? When they say decolonize, does it mean that we're still um, tied to the apron strings of uh, our colonial masters? If you can speak on this in three, uh, 30 seconds, that would be great. We are because uh, we've adopted, in essence, the Western liberal democratic model for a lot of Af for most African countries, and you know a lot of the um, the facets of it aren't necessarily applicable, or even if they are applicable, they're not very effective in restoring some sort of good governance or ensuring maximum political participation. So I think we really need to go to you know to the grassroots. We really need to ensure that political participation is done at the grassroots level. We need to break it down in such a way that the you know general population understands it. And we need to make people know that they have a role to play in the decision making of the 
country. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to be elected, but your voice counts in one way or the other. Thank you very much, Mr. Mbule Nzege Leonard, a research analyst for West Africa at Africa Risk Consulting. Thank you very much for the gift of your time. Thank you very much for listening. It was my pleasure. All right, so my takeaway today is that the conditions that incited old coup are still present and motivating new ones. I, however, agree with submissions that the risks of Africa returning to the widespread military role of the late 60s and early 80s is low, yet. There is a palpable risk of sliding into a culture of military siege on democratic governance where elected governments can become dependent on the military. Indeed, the task of democratic development in Africa is enormous, and as my guest has suggested, there are no quick fixes. African countries must, as submitted by scholar Mohammed Dan Suleiman, qualitatively democratize and global powers must rethink their centuries-old tradition of shaping and shaking African spaces in their favor. It will take time, and a steel will, but Africa has it, and we will prevail. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Until then, stay safe and protect yourself from COVID-19.